I'm delighted today to introduce Jonathan Baker. Jonathan Baker leads the mergers and acquisitions practice at Punctuation, which is an advisory firm specialising in small to mid-sized marketing firms. Jonathan graduated from Emory University's Goizeta Business School in 2005 and began his career in marketing strategy consultancy, working with Fortune 500 CPG companies. In 2011, he co-founded Monday Night Brewing, a popular leisure destination in Atlanta, Georgia, focusing on marketing and sales, which he still owns while working alongside his father, David C. Baker, who many listeners will be familiar with, as he is one of the most well-known uh, advisors to the agency industry and author of several books, including The Business of Expertise, Secret Tradecraft of Elite Advisors. And um, I've also had the pleasure of working with Jonathan in our seminar that we ran recently in Atlanta um, about account management and project management. So I'm going to be asking Jonathan about his advisory work with David. So big welcome, Jonathan. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Yeah, me too. I'm happy to have you. So I'm going to dive straight into the questions because I love uh, the, the audience to get as many tips and ad advice from you while I've got you. So just let's start off with, have you seen more agency owners wanting to sell or buy over the last year? Over the last year, it's been interesting. Uh, I think this is the first time I've seen that there are more buyers than there are sellers. Um, so, you know, 2023 was soft, I think, for many firms. Um, and interest rates also went up, which I think knocked some potential sellers out of the market. But now we have more buyers than there are sellers. That's interesting. Because, well, I wouldn't have expected that, but I would, yeah. And is that in any particular area? Is there any particular discipline that people are looking to buy? I think no. Um, digital agencies continue to be pretty hot. Um, and any agencies with, you know, a chunk of recurring revenue. But if you are you know, you have a certain industry focus or something that's kind of evergreen in a sense, uh, you're, you're always in demand. We are. That's interesting. So would you say that being sort of vertically positioned sort of sets you up for success when, when looking at potential buyers, you know, at that point? Yes, I would. Um, it, you know, narrows your, your pool of buyers in some sense, but the pool of buyers that remains is much more interested and, you know, unable to build that practice themselves. Mm. I mean, this is probably a bit of a ridiculous question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Are there any particular verticals that are more um, sought after, would you say? That's a ridiculous question. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I mean, it really varies. It could be construction products, uh, automotive, legal, hospice care, like it's really across the board. Across the board. Are the, um, what types of companies are buying then? If you've got more buyers at the moment or over the last year that you've seen, what, how do they come? Do they again come in all shapes and sizes? Are they other agencies, for example? Are they consultancy businesses? Yeah, so we see, we, you know, we've always seen a steady stream of private equity buyers although they tend to be interested only at, you know, kind of a, a larger size. Um, the majority would be other agencies looking to level up um, so that they can kind of, you know, pour gasoline on their own fire in terms of growth. Um, and I, we're also seeing more just individuals for the first time who, um, you know, want to buy something smaller they know themselves, they know they aren't as good at building as they are at, or they aren't as good at starting as they are at building. Gosh, that's really interesting. So first question, the PE buyers, you said that they start being more interested at a larger size. At what kind of million turnover would you say that they start getting interested in buying? Uh, most, so it depends on the size, but most of them, I would say at 3 million US dollars and up, 
in terms of EBITDA, uh, which can translate to, you know, like a 10 to $15 million agency. Interesting. There was someone that I, I spoke to recently who works alongside private equity firms to buy typical creative agencies and then flip them kind of re reconfiguring them and then kind of selling them on. Is that something you see? Um, we don't see the standalone flip as often as we do the kind of holding company model where a firm will be buying multiple agencies to then package as one and flip. That's interesting. And with the individuals, sorry, we're getting a bit granular with the buying, but it's just genuinely interesting. The buyers that are the individuals that are kind of looking because they're good at growth, they're not particularly good at starting. What would be the profile of these individuals? They generally have some kind of high level agency experience. Um, and they either have, you know, the propensity to take on some level of risk uh, in terms of taking on loans or they've just saved enough money and socked it away. Um, beyond that, there's not a ton in common, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that's interesting to know full stop. I mean, what are some of the other reasons that, um, let's go to the selling side. Let's Let's think about the sellers. What do you see as the typical reasons for wanting to sell? Uh, the agency. Yeah. Well, the, the obvious one is retirement, right? Um, along with that though, fatigue. And I would say sometimes that's related to hitting kind of that retirement age, but oftentimes it's not. Um, I think, you know, COVID uh, was really tough on a bunch of firms. And I think you, you have some owners who just don't want to go through that again or anything like it. Um, Another reason owners sell is because they're just having trouble getting over a certain growth hump. Uh, you know, there are kind of milestones <laughs> in your life, in your uh, life cycle as an owner. And, you know, there, there are points where you have to either add a second layer, layer of management. You have to uh, kind of increase your processes. You have to become less reliant on yourself for business development. And some of this stuff is just harder for others than, than it is for some. So um, selling can actually be a good way to help, you know, get your firm past that hump. Um, and then the last, the last reason we see is to bring on a partner. Uh, an agency can be very lonely uh, and if, you know, maybe you lose a partner, maybe you've been solo, but you want to bring someone in who's been working with you a while, there's, you know, a lot of different scenarios, but that's another reason we sell. And that's not, or we see people sell, but that's not always a full sale, right? That's oftentimes a partial sale. Interesting. When you say that there are certain humps in the milestones of the agencies, I know you typically deal with independent, small to mid-sized firms. What would you say are those revenue points in which agencies typical typically sort of struggle or or but you know they hit a bit of a a hump in the road that they can't get past? Yeah, I we see it um both on the revenue side and on the team size side. So on the revenue side, I think around a million uh, you know, between one and 1.5 million, we see folks get stuck. Um, and then on the team size side, uh, you, you see a little bit of a, a tough go between kind of 10 and 12. But then I think the bigger issue comes between 20 and 25 team members. And that's when, you know, it's apparent that the culture needs to be something beyond you, right? <laughs> yeah. And presumably, at what point do the processes, the internal processes kind of break? Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of processes break at that point. Mm -hmm. um, when, when you are no longer able to manage 
the team directly or, you know, fairly indirectly, when you are reliant on others to manage the team and the work, that's when you start seeing holes in your processes. Do you have any recommendations for firms who are growing in terms of what comfortably they should be aiming to grow every year? Like, I'm sure it, it's also dependent on their ambition and what they want to achieve. But do you have any kind of go-to pieces of advice for agency owners who want to do maybe a steady growth? What would you deem as steady? Well, first, let me say that growth shouldn't always be the goal. Um, sometimes, you know, depending on who you are as a person, growth is not in the cards and that's great. That's fine. Um, we don't like to see growth beyond uh, around 30% a year. Um, and, you know, 10 to 20% feels more sustainable above 30% and it can, things can start to get out of hand, particularly when you reach one of those inflection points. And are basically trying to blow past it without pausing to make sure that you've got the right team, that you've got the right processes, that you know your your clients can support it, and that you can support continuing to build the firm. Because the bigger you build it, the the more you have to bring in monthly just to pay the staff. <laughs> yeah, I know that you and David give really sort of sound advice when it comes to this kind of things because you have so much benchmarking data. And having worked in the industry for, I know David for over 30 years, he's seen everything and, but he's very specific about where he sees kind of, um, well, giving people parameters, which I think are really useful ultimately. So. Yes. Do you, um, let's, let's talk specifically about these agencies that maybe have got it in their mind that they want to sell. Can you share some of the sort of typical criteria for them to be market ready? Yeah. So uh, track record in terms of, you know, consistent revenue growth or consistent profitability, um, the magnitude of your profits. I think it's hard below around $250,000. Uh, USD, uh, all these figures will be USD, uh, to find a buyer. Uh, and it's much more likely to find a buyer at a million dollars plus in profitability. Uh, your positioning needs to be as tight as possible. You need to be, you need to have clean books, uh, financial books, and you also need to be on accrual accounting. You know, there's no way you can get an, a, a, a deal done without switching to accrual. And so, you know, it's something we recommend the firms do sooner rather than later. Um, we've talked a lot about good processes, but I'll say in particular, good business development processes, having those in place, even if you don't necessarily need them all the time, but you have a you have a point of view on how to bring business into the firm when you need it. And then generally being not as founder reliant. Um, and that doesn't mean you need the founder hundred percent out of the business, but if the founder was to take, you know, a three week vacation, <clears throat> the firm wouldn't fall apart. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's, let's go through those because I'm sure everyone listening is, is interested Regarding positioning, how often should an agency reevaluate their positioning? Um, that's. I mean, you. I think you can always be doing slight tweaks, but in general, you don't really want to change your positioning very often. Um, you want to keep it, you know, because there's there's power in the longevity of being able to be experts in a certain field. And so the longer you can kind of keep that running, the better. I, I think that's just such good advice. And I, you know, just a small side example, when I get a, working with account managers, 
it's so much easier for them to cross sell, upsell, add more value to existing clients when they are more tightly positioned because they become experts. So I love that advice. When you say clean books, can you give me some examples of what you would deem clean? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. So if you were to print out your P&L and your balance sheet, um, look through your P&L and all those line items, you know, the sum of those is referred to as your chart of accounts. Does your chart of accounts make sense? Is it too detailed or is it not detailed enough? Um, Are you cataloging things correctly from year to year? You know, if, if an external buyer was to look at this, would they have a ton of questions or would they generally understand what's going on? And then on the balance sheet, I think you as a buyer or you as a seller need to understand every line item on there. A lot of times the balance sheet is kind of where the bodies are buried. Um, And so you need to make sure that there are no skeletons in your closet, (laughs) so to speak. Um, And then on the, you know, accounts payable, accounts receivable side, just making sure that you're diligent about collections, you're paying your vendors on time. Uh, that stuff does matter. Very good. What are your general, what do you see in terms of payment terms for um, suppliers of agencies? Uh, so in in terms of receiving the money or giving? Yeah. Receiving yeah. the money. Um, we like, you know, we see a lot of net 30 um, and we like to see as much of that current as possible. Um, if you see anything over 90 days old, that's when yellow flags start to go up. Mm. I've got another question about the processes. You said that business development processes were key, uh, one of the criteria that you should pay attention to. Can you give me some examples of what a good development, uh, business development process would look like? Yeah. Um, and it, it will depend. The business development process should be built on the expertise of the founder and the personality of the founder. So these are purely examples, but, you know, a podcast would be a good one if you have kind of a regular podcast. I don't know if you know anyone like that. No, um, not, not with anyone that's any good, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, having kind of a regular speaking circuit that you do, uh, posting blog posts, you know, at a, on a particular cadence and then turning those into a newsletter that goes out to a certain number of people on a particular cadence. Um, trade shows, if you are industry focused, that you know, you're all, you always have a booth at X trade show. There are a number of ways to tackle this. And it's really around having a perspective having something kind of documented and then it not being 100% on the founder. You want other folks involved in the business development process, even if it's, you know, writing blog posts or something like that. Um, You can get them more involved as time goes on, but you want to just start pulling some of that away from the founder because in theory, the founder will not be there for forever. No, that's a really good piece of advice, actually, for those maybe account managers that are listening. I do, I do see that some founders I watch online are posting, but it, I think there's a huge opportunity for their whole team to be either sharing or commenting or just to get more visibility. Do you agree? Do you see that as well? Yes, I absolutely agree. Um, you know, it's... <laughs> It can be intimidating because like it's hard to kind of live up to the posts of the founder or whatever because they were the ones with the 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 seed of the idea. But um you need to start somewhere and you need to start building an audience. And that, you know, that's slow and it takes time. Mm. Yeah, and, and they could help, couldn't they? It it does it does take time. It's one of those things that consistency consistently ma- consistency matters. Um I think the the point about the speaking one is an interesting one. Like you said, if you're vertically positioned, then you can choose the trade shows or the conferences or seminars and and podcast episodes that you can then speak on. So 
I think one helps the other, doesn't it? It does. Absolutely. And, you know, I think uh, some of the challenge is really finding the time to seek those opportunities out, which is another way to get more team members involved. If they can do some of the searching and vetting and even proposing topics and things like that. So true. What, I mean, having worked in the m a practice for um quite a while now what are the questions that agency owners should be asking you um that p- p- perhaps they're not what what goes kind of overlooked so i've got a few examples one is uh how concerned should i be with the terms offered in the sale one is how far into this process can i get without a lawyer um, how and when do I handle telling my staff? And then how will the buyer fund this deal? Oh, this sounds great. So how concerned should they be about the terms? <laughs> very, <laughs> very. Uh, the valuation is really just kind of a point in time number and the deals are rarely all cash up front. They do, you know, know, we do see that, but it's rare. Usually you're going to get between zero and 50% of the purchase price up front. And so the remaining amount is contingent on certain terms, the terms of the deal. That could be your continued employment. It could be client retention. It could be maintaining or growing profitability, growing top line revenue. Um, and so basically, you know, usually over 50% of your potential uh, payout is at risk once you sell. And that that's all dictated by the terms. And do you see that there's a normal kind of, how, how long do they typically have to be tied into the business before they can fully exit? So it, it does depend, but I think the average is probably two to three years. Um, sometimes we see five years. Sometimes we see zero years. Interesting. And it depends just on the buyer and their strategic goals. Mm, and what they want to achieve ultimately. And when should they get a lawyer involved in this process? Uh, usually later than they expect. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. Uh, lawyers have a tendency to blow up a lot of deals um, by just kind of overworking them or over negotiating points. And uh, you certainly do need a lawyer, but I think I like to see lawyers come in after we've seen an LOI, a letter of intent. Um and even then, it doesn't have to be like a super specialized M&A attorney necessarily, uh, depending on the size of the transaction. That's really useful in itself. I, yeah, I would never have expected that. I would have thought, oh, as soon as you can. But no, no. They're anyway. very expensive and very verbose. And, you know, usually these are easier deals to negotiate if we're doing it with bullet points at the beginning. Mm. Okay, very interesting. Now, the the thing about telling the staff is a really interesting one because clearly we've got listeners who are employees, team members, and when we're talking about M and A, sometimes it might go through the employee's head. You know, is my agency owner planning to sell? What would happen to me? And da da da. So, what what is your advice for how and well when to bring the staff into that decision? So. Um usually as late as possible. And that's mostly because a lot of deals fall through. Even if they seem sure, they might fall through. And there's this just emotional burden of carrying the weight of a potential sale. Um, Sometimes even more so as an employee, just with the uncertainty of what my future looks like. And uh, so I would say, you know, usually for most employees as late as possible and maybe not until um, the deal is about to happen Uh, for key employees, key employees who, you know, would be necessary to ensure a smooth transition. um, 
and who I think can kind of hold the idea of an acquisition in their heads at the same time as they do the work. Uh, you can get them involved, you know, pre well, or right around LOI. Um, you might want them to meet the, the buyer before you sell. Um, but I think the the overall answer is it depends a lot on the person you are talking about. So these plans have to be formulated for the personalities in the room. There's no kind of one size fits all. How important is it that you choose two cultures that are going to be in alignment? I'm speaking as someone who has been through a merger that was disastrous. Um, <laughs> It was, and 90% of the staff left because of the the difference in management styles, et cetera. So presumably that is one of the big considerations, but but how, how would you possibly go about evaluating that? Yeah, I mean, you know, for us, when we're doing small to mid-sized transactions, uh, culture is extremely important. It's probably the biggest factor in terms of predicting the success of any particular deal. Um, and it is tough to gauge, but usually the culture is dictated from the top down at some level. And so if the owners of these firms or the founders of the firms um, think the same way, get along, respect each other's point of view, that's a good indication, an early indication of whether or not this will work out. Uh, another way to look at it is, you know, seeing how the employee handbook experience is documented, onboarding, that type of thing, performance reviews, is there alignment on, you know, how we're holding our team accountable, what are the ways that we do that, and how often are we having check-ins? Um, you know, we see some firms that are running EOS, the entrepreneur's operating system. And usually if you've got a firm like that, it's a pretty good indication that another firm like that, uh, would be able to get along, but <laughs> not always. Not always. No, but that's a, that's a great, um, tip actually. Uh, and I do know a, a client of mine is actually uh, several people that I know are running EOS um, do you see that a lot? Uh, probably just as much as you do. Yeah. Yeah. Just seems quite, quite popular. Now, the fourth point that you said, I've written it down, but I haven't written it down correctly. It was something about buyer funding. Yeah. How will a buyer fund the deal? Okay. So what's, what questions should they be asking about that? So during the due diligence period, you know, the bulk of the due diligence is, the buying firm looking at the selling firm and making sure that all the T's are crossed and I's dotted, but there should be due diligence going the other way as well. If you are, particularly if you are putting 50 plus percent of your future earnings at risk in a deal, you want to feel pretty good that that firm's going to be able to pay out and not necessarily just, continuing acquisitions, you know, indefinitely and robbing Peter to pay Paul, uh, running some kind of weird pyramid scheme. <laughs> and that wouldn't be deemed, this is going to be another ridiculous question. It, it's the kind of question they should be asking for sure. I mean, that just seems like, oh my gosh, yes, of course. But from the buyer's perspective, is there any kind of pushback on that and say, well, that's my problem? <laughs> yes. Uh, it is a tricky one to navigate, um, which is, I think, why it's nice to have a an M and A advisor involved to have some of those tricky conversations. Um, but it could be as simple as looking at a balance sheet. You don't often need a ton of data. Um, you know, if they're using debt financing, maybe you are kind of interrogating their bankers a little bit more than you are interrogating them. Um, so, it, you know, every situation is a little different, but uh, yeah, you do have to be careful about how you approach those conversations. 
Talking about getting an external advisor in, um, tell me about maybe one of your successful transactions um, and why it was successful just for, for everyone listening that might be interested in going through this journey and, and seeking the help of a of an M&A &A advisory firm. This is, uh, yeah, this is always an interesting question because we are under pretty strict NDAs for most of the deals we do. But um, I actually think some of my most successful transactions were ones that we advised not to happen. Um, and I think there's a lot of value in someone in your corner telling you, I don't think this is the right deal for you. Let's move on. Um, because you can get into a situation, you know, you touched on it where there's just cultural misalignment or there's uncertainty about where the funding is coming from, or you're just starting to see like, you know, signs of nitpicking that, you know, are going to bloom into something more sinister later on. Uh, so I, I feel most proud of some of those moments where we actually walked away from a deal. I can imagine that that would build a lot of trust. Uh, I hope it does. Yes. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we uh, want what's best for our clients. Um, this industry is populated with good people doing good work. For the most part, there's a few bad eggs, obviously, but, uh, and so it's rewarding to be able to help them reach their goals. I can imagine, um, because, you know, even if a deal falls and you, you advise not to go forward with one deal, you know, it hasn't necessarily stopped the owner still wanting to buy or sell. And therefore the likelihood is they'd probably come back to you again for that advice because it's been based on what's best for them rather than maybe what's best on the, with the, for the advisory firm. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, cause different advisors get paid out in different ways on deal structure. Um, so, I mean, usually telling someone to walk away is not in my best interest financially. Uh, but, uh, it'd be hard to live with myself if I didn't, mm -hmm. If, it, if if I was signing someone up to work for three years for a monster. How do you get um, compensated for your work? Is it any different to any other M&A advisory firm? Yeah, some are just flat percentages. Um, we do a combination. There's a $20,000 fee, flat fee. And then we do a small percentage of the cash we are able to secure for you at close. And so our... Financial incentives are aligned with getting you as much cash up front as possible, recognizing that the rest is going to be at risk. Very cool. Very interesting. And for those um, listening to this, um, and I've just shared my personal experience, which probably sounds extremely negative, but what impact does an agency sale have generally on a, on a team? So it depends on the type of buyer. If you've got, you know, a holding company or a private equity firm, those are typically going to be pushing for growth quickly. And that isn't necessarily a bad thing, but um, you're going to need to steal yourself for quick growth. Uh, if you're selling to another agency, I think generally it's very positive. Um, you've got new learning opportunities now. You've got new growth opportunities, right? A lot of employees have kind of, the smaller agencies in particular, kind of worked their way up to the top of the food chain. There's nowhere else to go. But if you get acquired by a larger agency, all of a sudden the, the world opens up again. That's really true, actually. And I, I know of other acquisitions because I was, I've worked both sides of the fence, but I, I was working in a holding company who was acquiring independent firms, and those employees saw the saw the network agency as an opportunity to travel, to work internationally, etc. So you're right. I mean, I think there's there is something potentially in it for the individuals for sure. Yeah. Um, Jonathan, could you sort of talk a little bit about the agency landscape? Um, 
what are you seeing currently that's affecting the M&A activity? I think you mentioned when we first started recording about um, kind of the the cost of living crisis, the, the COVID. I suppose all of these external factors are important, but anything that you're seeing generally? I think in general, everyone's freaking out about AI, but we're not seeing that impact the M&A market yet with the notable exception of content agencies. Uh, so content agencies, I think there is a lot more uncertainty about what the you know medium term future looks like. Um, and they're not necessarily trading at lower multiples yet, but I could see that happening soon. Generally, you've got interest rates starting to stabilize. I think, you know, they will start to go down. Um, and you've got a ton of buyers. Frankly, we just need more sellers as long as they're, you know, if you're, (laughs) if you're thinking about selling and have realistic expectations about what that looks like now is a great time to enter the market because, uh, uh, there's just a lot of folks looking for smaller firms. So questions, questions. There are, I mean, funnily enough, the majority of people that listen to this are based in the States, but there are also obviously UK and European agencies that listen. When you say we need more sellers, um, what kind of, who should be kind of putting their hand up right now i mean any type or have you got some criteria at the moment uh if you've got a good positioning a good niche and you are over 250k in ebitda but ideally over a million in ebitda i would say you're a good candidate um you're seeing a lot of european firms asian firms trying to expand their services into the U.S. And so I think particularly as a U.S. firm, it's a great time to sell right now. Mm. And do you see a lot of the U.K. firms getting bought by U.S. firms? We don't see that as much. No, okay, just the other way around. Interesting. Um, You said that content agencies have a slightly more of a potential impact of AI in the medium term. What would be your advice for someone that's listening that perhaps falls into that bracket? First of all, when you when you say medium term, how long do you think? I know it's a difficult question. I'm not yeah. saying you've got the answers to everything. Yeah, right. But... <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, two to three years is kind of the, the timeline I have in my mind. And the way I would approach it is just being honest with yourself on if you have the capacity mentally, emotionally, physically to see through a a large transition in your industry. Um, If you don't, then maybe consider selling before that happens. If you do, you could do very well. You just have to, you know, be able to make strong, decisive decisions, be okay pivoting, really embracing new technology, not running from it. Mm, good advice would you with the pivot any recommendations for which way to pivot i'm asking you such (laughs) no right i am not a futurist (laughs) no no i i think it starts with just not being scared of ai and really digging in so that you can find think about where the areas of opportunity might be and how you might be able to capitalize on them. Mm, Good advice. Good advice. There is a content marketing agency in the UK that I know of who's fully embraced AI from an internal process management perspective. Everything that they do has been systemized and they've even created their own sort of trademarked AI tools for internal processes. So they're very ahead of the curve, let's say. Um, and I know other agencies are kind of keeping an eye on this and um, who who knows uh, how long we've got. But the other thing, Jonathan, I wanted to get your take on was I see a lot of agencies still doing sort of what I call downstream work, um, kind of execution work, 
rather than consultancy work, like working more upstream with clients on on marketing strategy and kind of having a real look at their business, the client's business goals and being able to sit at the table and actually make recommendations on different communication channels. Um, would you say that that's something you would agree agencies should be looking at to, to kind of focus their efforts a little bit more upstream? I think certainly, uh, but you need to make sure you're doing it in light of a certain positioning. And so downstream work can actually be really great um, if you are specialized in the downstream work. If you're doing, you know, uh, food photography, for example, or some, something that, you know, it, yes, technically downstream, but also you, you do need a fair amount of insight, um, which is born out of that kind of strategy thinking at the beginning. Mm. I think on the positive note, their AI tools are allowing us to do a lot more research behind the client's business very quickly um, and kind of get to grips with the client's industry and market and competitors. So I think in that sense, AI is hugely helpful to well, agency account managers, but certainly anyone in the firm that wants to kind of understand the client's business in more depth so that they can consult. Um, are there any other changes that you see coming up for agencies in the future apart from AI? Uh, it's really hard to predict. And it's, I think it's so, you know, agencies are so dependent on the clients that they serve. And so you're, particularly if you're serving particular sectors, your, your success in some ways is tied to the trends in that sector. Um, so I don't have a strong answer for you there. No, but I think that's a strong answer in itself because actually I think from a mindset perspective, this is what I see from account managers. It's being proactive and carving out some time to really understand the client sector, like you said, their competitive environment so that they can keep ahead of what's their, the clients experiencing and not just maybe the, the digital marketing trends that we are seeing as agencies. So I think that's a really good uh, insight, actually. Um, any other piece, final pieces of advice before? I know I've squeezed you dry for every question, but <laughs> is, there, is there anything else that you haven't shared that you think might be valuable for an agency that's thinking either about selling or buying? I think... Networking is is important. Networking with agencies that you admire, um, if you're looking to sell. Uh, networking with agencies that have something you don't have, if you're willing looking to buy. Um, so just kind of keep an open mind because you never know where those relationships will go. Interesting. So have ongoing conversations and put yourself in the environment where other agencies going to be that potentially could be potential partners in the future. Yeah, correct. Really good piece of advice. Anything else before we uh, wrap up? Uh, no, you can, you can reach out to us at punctuation.com slash creative. We have a special little landing page for listeners mm -hmm. of this podcast. Oh, amazing. Um, and you. you'll be able to, you know, mm -hmm. contact me directly, book some time on my calendar um, I love talking about this stuff. So happy to, happy to keep the conversation going. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We'll make sure to put that link in the show notes. So Jonathan, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. This has been very enlightening. Um, and yep. For those of you listening, reach out to Jonathan for a chat and, um, I will see you soon. Thank you so yeah. much. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Jenny. <laughs>